Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, welcome to session five of the Massive Open Online Course for the University of Nicosia's Master's Degree in Digital Currency. I'm your teacher, Andreas Antonopoulos. Uh, this week, I'm in a hotel um, because I'm on holiday. So uh, hopefully, the uh, Wi-Fi will continue to be good. We've done some tests, and it seems OK. Um, and welcome all. I can see uh, I can see you in the chat. Hello, hello, everyone. Uh, just a, a, some quick housekeeping, just some uh, information. So I have um, about a dozen questions or two dozen questions from the forums, from your conversations that happen in the Moodle uh, during the week. And those are the questions I will be answering first. Um, if you have a follow-up question, if you need a clarification, or you have a follow-up question directly related to something I have just talked about, or I'm answering at that moment, then please feel free to post your follow-up or clarification question in the chat. Um, mark it with follow-up or something like that so I can see, or clarification at the beginning of the question so I can see what it looks like, because um, the chat can move uh, a bit fast at times. If, however, your question is not directly related to something I'm answering, please put it in the Q&A. Uh, put your question in the Q&A, and then I can go to the Q&A when I'm finished with the questions from the past week uh, from everyone who posted in the forums in the Moodle uh, throughout the past week. Obviously, we want to encourage you to ask your questions in advance and ask them during the week rather than uh, in the live chat. All right. Our first question comes from Achilles. Achilles asks, in practice, how is difficulty adjusted to all nodes? Do the nodes calculate the difficulty every two weeks? Is this part of the source code? How do they know the exact adjustment? One more zero may suffice or may not. And how do all mining nodes acquire the adjusted difficulty at the same time? Is it possible for a while that some mining has not the updated difficulty level and results in ignoring a successful mining block? OK, so let me start from the last question. Uh, it is not possible um, that a successfully mined block is ignored because uh, mining nodes haven't got the updated difficulty. Although if a mining node is misconfigured and it calculates the wrong difficulty, uh, then it may produce a failed invalid node. But um, that's an exception. That's misconfigured software. So all nodes calculate difficulty, not just mining nodes. Uh, mining nodes, exchange nodes, um, merchant nodes, e-commerce nodes, wallet nodes, my node that's running at home, all of, if you're running a node, your node, they all calculate the difficulty. So how do they do that? The simplest answer is this. They use a simple equation and they all use the same equation with the same inputs at the same time. So they all get the same answer to the same equation at the same time. Meaning there is no synchronization here. There's no uh, communication between the nodes about the difficulty. They simply look at the blockchain, look at the difficulty that was recorded and how many blocks they have recorded. They're, that's their synchronization. They keep track of the blockchain. What is the current block? And at a specific block height, they make the specific calculation. And yes, that is in the source code. And in fact, just to for convenience, I'm going to paste that um, because it's a very small file that controls this part of Bitcoin. So um, I just pasted that in the chat. And it's in a, a source file called pow.cpp, pow, proof of work, .cpp, C++, on the GitHub repository for Bitcoin Core. You can find that. It's very, very easy to find. 
and the URL is github.com slash Bitcoin slash Bing um, slash blob slash master. That just means the latest version slash source slash POW dot CPP. So you can find it on GitHub. It's fairly easy. And I posted it in the chat. In that source code, what you would see, and I'll go through it step by step, is the calculation that the nodes make. And I've actually replicated some of that. So first of all, when do the nodes do this? Uh, difficulty retargeting happens every 2016 blocks. And that period is called an epoch. So the first epoch of Bitcoin is between block zero and uh, with block height zero and 2015. And then the second epoch is from 2016 to 4,031, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So every 2016, a new epoch starts and the blocks of that epoch have a new difficulty. So when you see that the previous epoch has finished, you've got the last block, the 2016th block of the previous epoch, you use that last block and the other blocks in the previous epoch to calculate the difficulty for the next epoch. And then you're waiting. You're waiting for the first block of the new epoch. And when you see the first block, that block must have the new difficulty in it, right? So your node does this. How does it do it? Uh, if you look on a, on a um, block explorer right now, you'll see that we are currently on block, let's say, 760,526, 526. And if you look at the details of this block, in the block itself, there's a timestamp and a difficulty recorded. The current difficulty is 36 trillion, 834, 35,682,546,787. All the blocks of the current epoch have that difficulty, 36 trillion uh, level of difficulty. Um, so when is the next epoch? Well, um, if, I, if I divide 760,525, the current block by 2016, I get 377 point something. So that means we're in the 377th epoch. So if I want to see when the 378th epoch starts, I multiply 378 by 2016, which is the length of an epoch. And that means that the first block of the new epoch will be block 762,048. Uh, so 762,048 is the first block of the new epoch. When I receive block 762,047, I know that's the last block of the current epoch. And I know that the next block, the one that ends in 048, is the first block of the new epoch and therefore will have a new difficulty. And I have to calculate that. My node has to calculate what that new difficulty is going to be. The miners have to calculate what that new difficulty is going to be in order to mine that next block correctly. And they will record that answer in that next block. So how do we calculate it? Well, we take the 2016 blocks from 760032, uh, uh, for example, uh, to 762048. Those 2016 blocks, ones we just received the last one. And we look at the timestamp the first block has and the timestamp the last block has, right? Um, the timestamps are in the blocks. And we simply uh, uh, deduct the last timestamp from the first timestamp, or sorry, the first timestamp from the last timestamp. And we look how long it took between those two timestamps. So how long did it take to mine 2016 blocks? Well. What is the expected time? The expected time is 10 minutes per block. So therefore, it should have taken 20,160 minutes, or you can calculate that in seconds or even milliseconds if you like, 
um, because the timestamp is a millisecond based timestamp. Once you know how much time it should have taken, and then you know how much time it actually took, you can see the ratio of those two numbers. So for example, let's say it should have taken 20,000 minutes, 20,160, that's the actual time, sorry, that's the uh, correct time it should have taken, the estimated time for 10 minute blocks. Let's say instead of 20,160, it took 22,160. So it took longer, about 10% longer um, to mine the previous 2016 blocks. Well, if it takes 10% longer, what does that mean? That means it's 10% too difficult. The exact calculation is done in milliseconds. And what you would do is you would divide the expected divided by the actual. So if I simply divide 20,160, divide that by 22,160, uh, I find 0 0.90. So uh, actually it's 0 0.90974729244. And because you're doing this in milliseconds, you're gonna get a nice big uh, number. Uh, with lots of decimals, and that's going to give us a, a good amount of accuracy. And then all you have to do is multiply um, the current difficulty by that number. So if it's currently 36 trillion and we need to, to make it 10% easier, then the difficulty has to go um, down. It has to get easier. Sorry, easier. Difficulty has to go up by 10%. So you make that adjustment. Now, because every node is looking at the same blocks, they're looking at the blocks of the epoch, every node is looking at the timestamps recorded in those blocks and the difficulty recorded in those blocks, and it's calculating expected time versus actual time as the difference of the two timestamps, and it's multiplying the difficulty of the previous epoch by the resulting ratio, what you get is the same answer. Every block, that's every node that looks at these numbers and does this calculation is going to get exactly the same result. Obviously, there is a rounding, uh, and they all use the same rounding function uh, because you, what you want to get is an integer number of difficulty at the end of this. And they all do it in exactly the same way. They get the same result. That result is the new difficulty. When the next block comes in, in the header, it should have that difficulty um, in it. And its proof of work should be um, such that uh, the proof is below that difficulty target. And that's how you know that the miner has correctly validated the block. Every node runs the same equation at the same time to anticipate the value of difficulty for the next block, including the miners, uh, and everyone gets the same exact answer. They don't have to talk to each other. The only point of synchronization is that they have the same copy of the blockchain app to that moment, uh, and therefore they know the same answer. So hopefully that's uh, understandable. Um, it's always difficult to do math uh, without a whiteboard, but hopefully you understood. And you can look at the source code in C++. It's relatively easy to read. It's not that difficult uh, to read the source code. The variables are named in a good way so that you can actually read not only how uh, a node calculates the next difficulty, but how often it can calculate it, um, how it makes the adjustments, and how it checks to see if the block has sufficient proof of work. You'll also notice in there that there is a limit on the difficulty adjustment. The dif difficulty adjustment can go up by a factor of four, so it gets four times uh, easier or it can go down by a factor of four, so it gets four times harder, but that's it. It cannot go more than a factor of four difference, right? Uh, in other words, from the current difficulty, you can either go to 25% or 400%, uh, but you can't go 
uh, higher or lower than that. And that prevents very big difficulty adjustments. Uh, no, I do not want to upgrade Ubuntu now. Thank you so much. Uh, thank God this isn't Windows. It would probably shut down this Zoom to update um, my operating system in the middle of a presentation. All right. OK, uh, if you have any follow-up questions on that, uh, feel free to ask them now. And um, we'll continue. Achilles asks again, in practice, how is the Merkle tree actually utilized by the nodes? Which part of the process does the Merkle tree use? The Merkle tree is um, primarily used in one place, and that is to summarize all of the transactions that are included in a block as a single hash, as a single fingerprint. You see, the thing is, you have to have uh, the block that has the proof of work committed to a specific set of transactions, and everyone can agree which transactions are in that block, and that is effectively then sealed with the proof of work. So the way you commit to a specific set of transactions, I mean, obviously you could take a hash of all of the transactions um, together, but that would be a very inefficient way because then it, you would need, uh, in order to prove that um, a block contained a specific transaction, you would need a list of all of the transactions and you'd need to hash all of the transactions in order to prove that a specific transaction was contained. The Merkle tree data structure allows you to have a more efficient mechanism of summarizing and proving that a transaction is part or not part of that summary. You only store the root of the Merkle tree in the block, which is one hash, one 256-bit hash. And then you can prove whether a transaction is part of that tree um, by doing um, up to uh, two to the n um, hashes. So for example, to do uh, 1,024 transactions, you only need nine hashes to prove the existence of any transaction in that tree um, because two to the ninth gives you uh, over a thousand transactions. So, and then similarly, if you want to, if you want to do 2,000 transactions, that's 10 hashes, 4,000 transactions, 11 hashes, 8,000 transactions, um, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, each time you double the number of transactions that you include in the block, you only need one more hash to add one more level to the tree because it's a binary tree to prove the existence of a transaction. That's a very efficient algorithm. Uh, if you think of it as a search algorithm or proof algorithm. The summary of all of the transactions that are included in a block is the hash at the root of the Merkle tree. And that hash is in the block header. It's part of the 80 bytes of the block header that then gets sealed by the proof of work uh, and cannot, uh, cannot be changed, becomes immutable by the proof of work. So that's primarily where the Merkle tree is used. Merkle trees are used in a couple of other places in the system, um, but th that use again is, is really to summarize data. After the introduction of SegWit, for example, uh, when the signatures were taken out of the main part of a transaction uh, hash, the part that a transaction that is hashed to produce the transaction ID, and the signatures are all hashed separately, there is now another Merkle tree, which is the witness tree. And the witness Merkle root is also stored in the block header. So you have the transaction Merkle root and the witness Merkle root. You have all of the transaction ID summarized to the transaction Merkle root. And then separately, all of the signatures, all of the witnesses summarized to the witness Merkle root. And um, so that after SegWit, you have two places in the block header that it's used. Uh, 
And some protocols within Bitcoin use Merkle trees to summarize uh, data that is transmitted between two nodes. Um, and again, uh, that depends on the implementation of different parts of the protocol. It's not part of the consensus. All right, the next question comes from Brian. Brian says, I very much enjoyed your videos about the Lightning Network. These videos, however, were posted back in 2017 and 2018. I think I've done some re more recent ones by then. The dream back then was that it would manage millions of transactions on a millisecond basis. Since that time, what has the Lightning Network been able to achieve? Well, the Lightning Network um, is capable of scaling to millions of transactions, and the latency can be extremely low, although it's not optimized to that level yet. Interestingly enough, we don't know how many transactions happen on the Lightning Network. And the reason we don't know is because the only nodes that know about a transaction um, and uh, can really uh, distinguish between payments are the sender and recipient of a payment. Um, everybody else may see payments going by. They don't know if those payments are uh, part of a single payment, if they're um, smaller parts, because you can actually break a payment into smaller parts and route them in parallel. Um, so they can count how much traffic is flowing through them, um, and it depends really on the nodes. Um, popular nodes, uh, well-connected nodes on the network, see thousands of Lightning transactions per day routed through them, uh, thousands of payments going through, um, but they're only seeing the part of the network that flows through them. They have no visibility over the rest of the network, and it's not really possible to, uh, to know how many transactions are happening in total. In fact, the bigger the network gets, the smaller the proportion of all of the transactions that a single node can see. Uh, in a way, we have even less visibility the bigger the network gets. Uh, Follow up from Shyam Kant. Uh, while not considering an optimization of any one issue, thinking of the Lightning Network and the parameters of trustlessness, decentralization, and security issues. Um, trustlessness, decentralization, and security issues weren't really the things that the Lightning Network optimizes on. Um, because in all three of those, um, the Lightning Network is uh, slightly less than Bitcoin. It can only ever be as trustless as Bitcoin, as decentralized as Bitcoin, and as secure as Bitcoin. It can't be more secure than that because it depends on its trustless decentralized security on Bitcoin. So Bitcoin sets the bar, and the Lightning tries to approach that as well as, well as possible uh, within that constraint. What the Lightning Network does is it gives you almost as much trustlessness, decentralization, and security as Bitcoin, only cheap, fast, and small payments. Um, and so it allows you to have your trustlessness, decentralization, and security, have your cake, and eat it too, um, because you also have cheap, fast, uh, private and uh, small transactions. So with Bitcoin, because of trustless decentralized security, you couldn't have cheap transactions because fees are required. You couldn't have fast transactions uh, because uh, global synchronization on 10 minute blocks. And um, you couldn't have private transactions because all transactions are public. So uh, it optimizes on three other things. Uh, while maintaining as much trust, decentralization, and uh, security as Bitcoin has. Um, Lightning uses the security model of Bitcoin, meaning that you do not have to trust the other participants on the network. You do not have to trust the other party that is uh, has a channel with you, um, the protocol, 
ensures that if someone tries to cheat, uh, you can actually um, effectively punish them by taking the entire balance of the channel, even their part of the balance, um, as a penalty for trying to cheat. So you don't have to trust anyone else on the Lightning Network as long as your node operates correctly and monitors uh, the network. Yeah. So it is a, it is a parent-child, yes, exactly. Um, the, uh, the base layer of Bitcoin provides the security characteristic. Lightning then allows you to build upon that and gain uh, some speed, uh, transaction efficiency, and privacy without sacrificing security. All right, we do have another uh, question about the penalty, but I'm going to get to that in a second. Um, CMAC asks, if every existing node in the network accepts the SegWit implementation, does that make it a hard fork? In general, is there a pathway for soft forks to become hard forks? Uh, what is there for nodes to have to think if they would want to use SegWit or not? Not exactly. I think you're misunderstanding what a soft and a hard fork is. In general, um, a, a hard fork is when the rules are broadened um, and a soft fork is when the rules are narrowed. Um, if I say you can only do this much in the rules, and then I make uh, a new rule says, well, actually you can't even, you have to do even less, then that's a soft fork. Because if you were previously um, compliant, uh, then uh, you are still compliant. Let me put it another way. Um, let's say, and I've used this, this restaurant analogy before. Um, you have um, a vegetarian restaurant, okay? And you have customers who come there because it's a vegetarian restaurant. Um, think of those customers as the nodes that are following the consensus rules. And the consensus rules are that the restaurant is vegetarian. So um, among other things, that means no meat. Great. Um, now, if you were to change the rules and say, we're going to add pork to the menu, then uh, because you are no longer a vegetarian restaurant, those who come to your restaurant because they're looking for vegetarian food have to change their behavior. They have to accept a new set of rules. And if they don't, they can't come to that restaurant, right? That's a hard fork. Um, so the nodes that don't change their behavior are basically out because the new behavior broadens the rules and allows things that previously were not allowed. Uh, so um, your existing customer base is unhappy. If you were to take your vegetarian restaurant and say, oh, well, now we're vegan. We're still vegetarian, but now we also don't allow any animal products at all. Um, and that means no eggs, no butter, no whatever. Um, now, all of your vegetarian customers can still come and they will still enjoy food because vegan is also vegetarian. You didn't uh, break the vegetarian rules. You just made them narrower and said, we're going to go even less um, animal products. And now we're vegan. Now you can have new customers who are strict vegans. You can also have your existing customers who are strict vegetarians. Um, and the existing customers don't need to change the rules or read the menu more carefully because they can still eat everything on the menu. That's a soft fork. So it doesn't become a hard fork, doesn't make it better, doesn't mean it's mandatory. Um, a soft fork is just a less um, controversial way to make changes because not everyone has to upgrade and change their behavior, they can still continue to operate. And it's a softer way to get consensus on the network because the existing nodes without changing their behavior can continue to remain synchronized. Uh, so that's what Segway, SegWit did and other soft forks have done. And 
Um, why would a node use SegWit? The simple reason is that uh, by using SegWit, you can save on transaction fees because you can produce uh, smaller transactions and uh, you get a discount on the signature uh, of the transaction. This is especially important if you're using complex scripts such as lightning scripts or other things like that. Um, some types of applications can only use SegWit because some types of applications require transaction chaining where you have a child transaction depending on a parent transaction and its transaction ID, protocols like the Lightning Network cannot use Bitcoin without SegWit. They need SegWit to operate. They need that in order to prevent cheating. And so in order to implement Lightning, we had to have SegWit. Um, other types of uh, reasons are simply saving in fees. And if you don't use SegWit uh, and you don't need SegWit and you don't want the discount, you can still use Bitcoin exactly as it was always used and all previous transactions are still valid. All right, so let's talk about malleability and how, um, how does SegWit take care of malleability? And I'll use, uh, there's a follow-up question in the chat, but I'll also use a question from the forum first. Abdullah asks, can you please elaborate more on this statement in relation to transaction malleability? When we say signature, don't we mean the private key signature that no one has access to? Um, no. Um, a signature is not something no one has access to. Everyone has access to the signatures um, because they need to verify the signatures. A signature is not the same thing as a private key. A signature is a number that is produced when you apply the private key to the transaction uh, hash um, using a special equation that is non-reversible, so you can't get the private key. And that's called signing. And signing is essentially calculating a number that anyone can use to verify that when you calculated that number, you knew the private key um, because you can verify that by comparing the signature of that number to the public key and the message um, without revealing the private key. So it allows you to demonstrate knowledge of the private key, uh, which shows that you are the authorized user of that Bitcoin address or Bitcoin public key um, without revealing with that private key. The private key remains private. The signature is a mechanism that you make public, a number that you make public, which can be verified by others to be, to be produced from the private key without revealing it. Um, so the signatures are uh, the part that used to be in a transaction in such a way that the transaction hash depended on the signature. What SegWit did was it um, changed the way we calculate the transaction hash and changed the way signatures were transmitted across the network so that the signatures are transmitted separately in a separate part of the block um, called the witness tree. The signatures are still there. They're just not inside each transaction. They're segregated. They're part of a signature tree that is transmitted with each block. Uh, and so, and um, so what SegWit did was simply remove them. And by removing them from inside the transaction, that means that the transaction hash does not depend on the signature. The fingerprint of the transaction does not depend on the signature. Um, the signature depends on the transaction hash, but the transaction hash does not depend on the signature. So once you've signed a transaction, you've committed the contents of that transaction because the signature is applied to the transaction hash. Once you're, it's signed, um, the transaction hash cannot change um, because the signature is applied to that transaction hash. If you change the transaction in any way, that signature will become invalid. The problem was that before SegWit, the transaction hash included the signature within it. The part that you signed uh, on the transaction with the signature, the hash that, of what you signed, and the transaction ID with two different hashes. 
And the result of that was that um, you could change uh, the resulting transaction ID in a way that didn't invalidate the signature. And that was malleability. So you could take a transaction that I had signed, for example, I had committed every part of the transaction except for the signature itself in the signature. Um, and you could verify that that transaction was properly signed. And then you could actually change something by modifying the signature a tiny bit. Uh, and it would still be a valid signature, but uh, the transaction ID would change. And what that would do is that it would cause confusion on the network. In fact, there was a particular attack that was used to confuse an exchange into thinking that its customers had not withdrawn the amount that they had withdrawn um, because the exchange used the one transaction ID to sign its withdrawals. And then people changed the transaction ID and rebroadcast the transaction uh, and the exchange didn't see that. Uh, it's a rather complicated idea. Um, The simple way is to explain it is the signature contains uh, a hash or fingerprint of the rest of the transaction, but the signature cannot contain a hash of itself because that creates a circular dependency. The signature can sign everything in the transaction except for itself. Uh, it's as if you take a check and on the signature line, you put a photocopy of the check and the signature itself. Uh, well, the photocopy of the check can't contain the signature because then it would be a photocopy of a photocopy of a photocopy of a photocopy to infinity, if you see what I mean. Um, the signature can't sign uh, itself because the hash of the signature uh, would need to be signed, which would change the signature, which would change its hash, which would then need to be signed, which would change the signature, which would change the hash and create the circular dependency. You can't do it. Uh, so the signature signs everything else. And that means that the signature itself is not committed. It's a complicated explanation. It doesn't matter though, because a lot of this is now ancient history. Arguably, um, we could say that uh, this was a bad design. The way that signatures were implemented in Bitcoin before segregated witness was a bad design. Um, and that bad design created some unwanted um, side effects. SegWit fixed part of those side effects. Um, and uh, we've continued to improve on that with Schnorr signatures even, even further. So the new signature format, Seg SegWit v1, um, is an improvement on SegWit v0 with Schnorr signatures. Um, Bitcoin has not remained the same. Bitcoin has actually improved in several different ways um, and fixed some problems with the earliest versions. All right, Lewis asks, um, on page 25 of the presentation, onion routing was introduced. There's an article there that says, the goal of onion routing is to have a way to interact with as much privacy as possible and to route traffic through multiple servers and encrypt it each step of the way. So I understand that Lightning was created, among other things, to scale, decrease transaction price, and provide anonymity. But doesn't this re uh, present AML, anti-money laundering risks? I understand that fundamentally these are two separate things. But for Lightning payments, uh, um, when Lightning payments can be handled off-chain, unlike in CoinJoin, would this lend itself for illegal situations? And there's a similar question from Maria. Uh, how transactions could be tra traced if they're processed via the Lightning Network and the only time they enter the blockchain is when a payment channel is closed? How can this AML risk be managed? Could this not be used to hide the flow of money? Are surveillance tools tracking transactions within the Lightning Network? 
Okay, so um, here's the there there are two fundamental problems with this. Uh, the bottom line is that you get privacy on the Lightning Network. You don't get perfect privacy. You don't get perfect anonymity, but you get significantly more privacy on the Lightning Network than you get on uh, the public Bitcoin network. The question then is, how do you manage anti-money laundering um, and transaction surveillance risks um, when illegal transactions happen? Um, and th the simple answer is, you don't. Uh, you accept the risk of um, transactions happening that may be illegal in some country or other um, because privacy is more important. There is a philosophical question here, which is in order to protect from some illegal transactions, based on which law, who knows, um, you know, it depends which country you're talking about. Um, in uh, some countries, it is illegal uh, to do things that in other countries it is perfectly acceptable to do. Um, in Saudi Arabia, it is illegal for a woman to buy a plane ticket without authorization from her husband. Is that something that you should protect against? Under this idea of money laundering, a woman using a private payment mechanism to buy a plane ticket to get the hell out of Saudi Arabia uh, would be practicing money laundering. Um, and uh, I would be very happy to send that woman the amount uh, for the plane ticket via the Lightning Network and violate the laws of Saudi Arabia because um, law is not justice. Justice and law are two different things. So the problem with anti-money laundering is that, one, it assumes a universal uh, set of laws which do not exist. Uh, every country has different laws, and whether those laws are just or unjust is a whole other conversation. Um, oh, apparently not anymore in uh, Saudi. Fantastic. I can give you a list of another 20 countries in which that is illegal. And uh, I'm pretty sure I can give you a list of another 20 things that are still illegal in Saudi Arabia that I would consider um, quite uh, moral practices regardless. Um, this is precisely the point. There is no universal morality or universal law that can be applied across every society um, that everyone will agree on or any universal justice. The question is, should you have comprehensive, complete, total, totalitarian surveillance of every means of payment everywhere in the world in order to protect against the possibility of illegal transactions? Humanity survived for tens of thousands of years without comprehensive surveillance of all exchange of value. Until very recently, cash was the fundamental mechanism for exchanging value, and there was no surveillance of financial transactions at all. And somehow societies did not uh, fall into uh, complete chaos because of crime. So the, the, the problem is that this idea of totalitarian surveillance is a relatively new idea. It started in the 1970s as the dream of some countries to uh, monitor all transactions of all people all the time. The truth is, in fact, that when you give that power, those who hold that power put themselves and their friends beyond that power. So they still get to do crimes, um, but uh, they also get to use their surveillance to uh, exercise political power. And that is a very, very dangerous power. So as someone who believes in some of the ideals of the cypherpunk uh, philosophy, I believe that privacy is a fundamental human right. And if you agree that privacy is a fundamental human right, financial privacy is also a fundamental human right. You cannot exercise political power if every payment you ever make can be um, seen by uh, those in power or if you cannot express your political opinion through um, 
for example, supporting organizations that you may uh, support, et cetera, et cetera. So the Lightning Network does not allow comprehensive totalitarian surveillance. And to me, that is one of the fundamental benefits. Uh, and that is worth paying the price that occasionally some transactions by some people may be illegal in some countries, um, but that prevents totalitarian surveillance of all transactions by a few very, very powerful organizations um, and intelligence agencies. You can decide how you spend your own money and whether the spending you do with your own money uh, is... Uh, just, is moral, is ethical. All right. Um, let's see. Alberto asks, can a wallet cancel a previously broadcast transaction before it is confirmed in a block? How? All right. This question has two answers. Um, and um, uh, a wallet cannot cancel a previously broadcast transaction. However, a wallet can broadcast a second transaction that spends the same inputs, that spends the same UTXO. Essentially, a wallet can attempt to do a double spend uh, and pay a higher fee on the second transaction. Uh, a wallet can do the, this in a way that respects um, the previous transaction through replace by fee or it can do this directly without having set replace by fee, simply by creating a transaction that double spends the previous um, inputs with a higher fee. And miners, in many cases, will confirm the transaction that has the higher fee um, first. And as a result, the other one that was broadcast previously is effectively canceled because its inputs have already been spent by the transaction that replaced it. You can use a higher fee to purposely double spend the inputs of your transaction if it has not been confirmed yet. If a transaction has not been confirmed, it can be double spent. And sometimes the double spending is done on purpose by the wallet that sent this transaction, and it is done to effectively cancel the transaction. Meaning that if you're selling something, for Bitcoin or any other blockchain that uses similar mechanisms, you cannot trust a transaction that has not yet been confirmed. Uh, do not ship them the very expensive TV um, before the transaction has been confirmed. Wait for confirmations. One, two, three, four, five, six confirmations. That depends on you because it depends on um, on the value of the thing you just sold them. Achilles asks, how does a full node find other nodes to connect? Is there a specific number of nodes? It should transmit the information about a verified transaction and a verified block. In contrast, is there a specific number of confirmations that a node should receive in order to reach consensus? Are these parameters mandated by the source code? Uh, Achilles, um, a node finds other nodes um, by learning about the existence of other nodes. And um, there isn't a specific number of nodes that you need to be connected to, peers, as they're called. You don't have to connect to a specific number of peers. And that is a parameter that you can set in your node software in most cases. So you can tell it what the minimum and maximum number of peers. By default, uh, that number is eight your node will connect to eight peers. It doesn't really need to be connected to more than eight, so the default number is perfectly fine. You probably shouldn't connect to less than uh, eight uh, because 
you can become isolated on the network if all of the peers that you connect to uh, lie to you, you can effectively desynchronize from the blockchain until you can find better peers. Um, you can detect that they're lying to you, but you can become disconnected from the network um, through that. Um, your node will connect to eight by default. How does it find these eight nodes? Well, nodes talk to each other all the time about what other nodes they know. So your node will keep a database of other Bitcoin nodes it knows about across the Bitcoin network. It will keep a list of IP addresses, or if you like, IPv6, IPv4, Tor, et cetera, network addresses and ports of nodes that it has previously connected to and nodes are reliable, uh, have sent its messages, and it will attempt to talk to those nodes again. Um, and it will select from that database eight nodes randomly when you start it up to connect to. If it's the first time you're turning on a node, it will not know uh, eight nodes to connect to. And so it will go through a process called a network bootstrap or network bootstrapping. And it does this through the DNS protocol. Through the DNS protocol, it will ask um, several uh, 16 well-known DNS uh, names, named nodes that are operated by various organizations and individuals that operate this as, as a useful service. And these DNS nodes will return a list of, uh, I think it's 16 different uh, Bitcoin node addresses um, that your node can try to start contacting. Uh, every time you connect to these DNS nodes, uh, for obvious reasons, they're not going to give you the same 16 um, addresses. They themselves keep a very large database of addresses of nodes they've seen recently on the Bitcoin network, and they will send you a random sampling of those uh, so that you connect in many different points all across the network. Uh, and um, once you connect to these, you will decide if they are giving you correct or incorrect information by verifying the transactions and blocks. Your node will do this. It will verify all transactions and blocks it sees. And if it's getting good information from these nodes, it will keep them in its database and, and connect them. And while it's doing so, we'll all also ask them, do you know any other nodes? And they will give uh, more uh, addresses, and it will gradually build a pretty big database so that it, it can always find someone to talk to when it first boots up. Um, so that process is, ensures that you get connections spread all across the network, and it's very difficult to introduce rogue nodes into the network because uh, people are just going to ignore them. How many confirmations do you receive? So you tell, your node will tell all other nodes about every transaction and block that it sees that is valid. And it will exchange that information with all of its peers. Uh, as I said, by default, it's talking to eight neighbors, eight peers, and it will receive uh, transactions from all eight of these, it will receive blocks from all eight of these, and it will send transactions and blocks to these eight neighbors. Um, obviously, it doesn't send a transaction back to the same peer that just told it about that transaction. It keeps track of, okay, um, Bob over here told me about these five transactions. So Bob clearly knows about these transactions and Bob knows about these blocks because Bob is the one who told me. But Charlie over here hasn't told me about these transactions. So let me tell Charlie about these transactions. So I'll start sending them to Charlie. Um, and that's how it propagates out. Ashley asks, if SegWit removes the witness of a transaction, would this mean that Bitcoin is conforming to mass adoption? Um, no, um, Ashley, uh, SegWit doesn't remove the witness of the transaction. SegWit simply calculates the transaction ID or hash such as not to include the witness part. And the witness part is still transmitted and still included in a block and confirmed with proof of work that is committed in a block. And by the way, if you have heard 
that SegWit removes a witness of a transaction or that transactions after SegWit don't have signatures um, or they can be less trusted because the network doesn't send the signatures. These are lies and not just lies, this is deliberate misinformation, propaganda by those who disagreed with the adoption of SegWit. And it is simply not true. It is simply not true. Um, transactions, SegWit transactions still have signatures and those signatures are still included in the blocks and they're still transmitted by nodes to each other exactly the same as they were before. They're just not packaged in the transaction and they're not included in the hash of the transaction. And that's done to prevent the problem of malleability. Um, and to actually improves the security of the Bitcoin network instead of reducing it. So be careful where you get your information. Uh, and when you hear things like that, uh, if you hear things that are obviously uh, or factually untrue and being told to you by someone who um, has essentially motivation to tell you information that is not true. Uh, well, that's not an accident. That's straight up uh, propaganda. And you should, uh, you should stop listening to those sources because uh, they were willing to lie to you to promote their agenda. All right, let's see. Milo asks, my understanding is that Bitcoin uses the UTXO model to, de to determine what is the available balance of a Bitcoin address in order to validate the transaction originating from such an address. Can you please explain how exactly the UTXO database is built from the blockchain and then checked by nodes in order to validate the transaction? Um, specifically, assuming a Bitcoin address has multiple different UTXO resulting from previous transactions, how does a node look into the whole blockchain to calculate what the sum of these UTXO are disregarding Bitcoin already spent by such an address? All right. So Milo, here's a, a, a very simple distinction to understand this. UTXO are indivisible chunks of Bitcoin that can be spent by a transaction. And they are either spent because they're in a block already confirmed or they're not spent. Um, and in that case, they're UTXO, they're unspent transaction outputs. Um, the concept of a balance of a Bitcoin address or the balance of a wallet, uh, first of all, there is no such thing as a balance of a Bitcoin address. Um, it, that is a, a kind of artificial concept that is created by your wallet to help you understand what's happening. Um, and uh, usually a wallet won't show you the balance of an address. It will show you a balance of all of the addresses that are controlled by all of the keys that the wallet has. Um, it will show you one uh, balance. So a wallet will construct an artificial sum of all of the balances of every UTXO unspent transaction output that is controlled by a, a Bitcoin address whose private key that wallet controls. So your wallet has private keys. It knows the Bitcoin addresses that correspond to that. And then it counts the total amount of uh, Satoshis effectively that uh, are unspent in transaction outputs corresponding to those public keys all across the blockchain. In order for your wallet to do this, it has to look at every block and every transaction since the Genesis block and build a database. And this is how your wallet will build a database called the UTXO database, which is um, not every transaction output ever, but only the transaction outputs that are still unspent up to now. So it will look at every block, creates un uh, unspent transaction outputs, uh, spend some and create some. Spends, creates, spends, creates. So every transaction spends the inputs and creates new outputs. And so every time uh, something is spent as an input in a confirmed transaction, your wallet will remove that 
UTXO ID from its database. And every time a new output is created in a transaction, your wallet will add that UTXO to the UTXO database. And that way, at any moment in time, it has a snapshot up to this block. This is all of the unspent transaction outputs that any uh, transaction could use um, as its inputs, that any transaction could spend. And now when it receives a new transaction or a whole block of new transactions, it can look at the inputs of that transaction and say, this input right here, let's look at transaction ID and output number. Has this been spent? Look in my own database. Has it been spent? No, nope, it's still here. I see it. It's unspent. And that's a pretty quick lookup because you've already built that database by going from the Genesis block. And it can produce um, it, it can produce an index to that database that allows it to look up specific UTXO very, very quickly and see, is it still spent or is it not? If it looks at a transaction and it looks at the inputs of that transaction and it can't find them in its UTXO database, that means they've already been spent. And if they've already spent, then that transaction is invalid. If it wants to know its own balance for all of the keys it controls, it basically just go, runs through the UTXO database, says, does this belong to me? Do I control the keys behind this UTXO? If no, ignore it. If yes, um, how much Satoshi is this? Now, it wouldn't actually just go through all of the UTXO database. It would take every one of its keys, produce the public key, produce the Bitcoin address, and then look for any transactions that mention that with a UTXO and then find out what the sum of Satoshis is. And that's when you look at your wallet and it says, you have this much Bitcoin. That's what it's doing. Um, basically added up all of the numbers. But it doesn't need to add up the balance of somebody else's UTXO in order to see if a transaction is valid or not. Because Bitcoin's validity or transactions validity doesn't depend on the balance you have. It depends on whether the specific input, the specific indivisible chunk of Bitcoin that is produced by a transaction in a UTXO that is listed in the inputs of that transaction, if those specific chunks have not been spent, then um, you can spend them. It doesn't matter what other UTXO you have or don't have. If you have other balance, it doesn't matter. To know everybody's balance in order to figure out if your UTXO have been spent or not in a transaction. Um, only your own wallet will look through and add up to produce a balance number. Um, so that's that's basically how it works. Let me give you a different example. Think of UTXO as coins. Uh, each coin is a specific amount. Um, now, if you have a purse and you have a bunch of coins inside and you want to know uh, how much money do I have in total in my purse, then you have to take out each coin, count them, uh, and count the total uh, value. But if you simply want to see and just see if you have one of those coins in there and pull it out. And even if you don't know what the rest of them are valued, as, you still know you have 10 pence. And if someone gives you 25 cents, um, you don't need to know how many coins they have in their purse or in their bank or in their, under their mattress. All you need to know is, do they have the 25 cents that they just gave me? Yes, they just gave it to me. That 25 cents, is that real? As long as you've confirmed that, you don't need to sum up the rest of their balance. So balance and different things. Balance is an artificial number. It's a sum of all of the UTXO that you control, that your wallet produces so that you know your total value. And it's not actually used to validate any transactions. Yes, um, I will be looking at the Q&A at the end. Um, so yes. Is UTXO used in all blockchains? No, um, not even in all blockchains that use proof of work. 
Um, UTXO is used in Bitcoin. UTXO is used in Litecoin. It's used in a, a, a bunch of other blockchains. But honestly, nowadays, the majority of blockchains use the uh, account model that is used in Ethereum that is hard to audit and validate, um, but is more efficient for smart contracts. And because it's produced today are copies of Ethereum uh, rather than copies of Bitcoin, um, most of them use the account model, not the UTXO model. I think it's only a handful of any of the top 100 blockchains that use the UTXO model. Um, Rob has a question about the test for week five. I, I don't know anything about the administration of this course. Do not ask me about tests and exams. That is a question for the administration. Please contact um, the administration of the course uh, uh, through the Moodle and ask for support there because I cannot answer that. All right. Uh, which Anant asks, could you please give an explanation of how the Lightning Network penalty works and how does L2 improve them? Uh, um, I can give a very high level explanation. Honestly, it's like half a chapter in the Lightning book if you want to read more detail about it. But in Lightning, you produce uh, with your channel partner, you produce um, new transactions uh, that are called commitment transactions that you um, sign to update the channel. And these transactions are asymmetric. So I produce a commitment transaction and my channel partner, let's call him Bob, produces a commitment transaction and we exchange commitment transactions, sign them and exchange them back. And that's a two part process. There's a, there's a dead the channel state forward. When I have a signed commitment transaction, if Bob disappears at any moment in time, gets disconnected, stops responding to messages, I can take that commitment transaction and I can broadcast it and commit it to the Bitcoin blockchain. It's a Bitcoin transaction. And when I do so, that, that will update the channel and effectively close it and pay me my balance for the latest state. So I'm always holding a signed transaction that both Bob and I can sign. Uh, Bob has already signed, and I can just add my signature and send it, and that will close the channel for both of us. Now, it, whether I close it with my copy of the transaction, which I sign, or Bob closes it with his latest commitment transaction, doesn't matter. If either one of us closes it, it's not a cooperative close because we didn't negotiate that close, but it's fine because... Um, we're using the latest commitment transaction with the most up-to-date balance, and that's fine. However, what we want to avoid is Bob closing the channel with an old commitment transaction. So during the dance of exchanging signatures for the current commitment, what we do is we also exchange a set of penalty keys that can be used against us if we try to broadcast an old commitment. Now, I still have all of the old commitments on the channel. If my node makes the mistake of trying to broadcast one of these, in that commitment transaction, it says, pay Bob immediately, because it's the one I'm holding, it always pays the other party first. And then it says, or pay Andreas after two weeks. Now, I could broadcast that, but then as soon as I broadcast that, it's going to pay Bob immediately, but it's going to leave me hanging with a time lock for two weeks. I can't actually spend the Bitcoin in it. And it also says, or if Bob has the penalty key, give Bob Andreas's balance too. So if I broadcast that old transaction, because I've given Bob the penalty key to invalidate it, um, Bob can then go online and say, well, I'm going to take the Bitcoin that was my balance immediately. And here's the penalty key. I'm also going to take Andreas's uh, Bitcoin from the channel because that old transaction and here's my revocation key. So that's how you do this dance and the penalty. Uh, 
hope that explains it. Now, Bob has commitment transaction, but I know that all of Bob's clients say, pay Andreas immediately. And then they say, and pay Bob after two weeks, unless Andreas presents a penalty key, in which case, give Bob's balance to Andreas too. So I know that as soon as I have the penalty key, I'm no longer worried about Bob broadcasting that old transaction, because if he does, it's payday for me. I get my balance immediately. Then I use the penalty key to get his balance too. I get both sides of the channel and he regrets producing that commitment. So that's how we burn our old commitments and only have the new ones uh, that are actually useful. Uh, Which Anant asks, was the multi-sig feature inherent in the early version of Bitcoin? Yes. And do we have to use script in pay to script hash or others? Uh, multi-sig uh, can be used um, without a pay to script hash um, or inside a pay to script hash. Nowadays, nobody does bare multi-sig as it's called without a pay to script hash. So um, pay to script hash is how you do it. And a pay to script hash transaction has the script inside. And if that script is a multi-sig script, then it's a multi-sig uh, transaction. All right. Um, Will asks, regarding the section on hard forks, could you explain the factors that allow to BT to succeed over BCH following the 2017 hard fork. Um, by succeed, I mean that most metrics, market cap, number of active wallets, hash rate, etc., BTC has outperformed BCH. However, my understanding is that the, in the initial aftermath of the hard fork, there was a lot of speculation that BCH would compete and eventually outperform BTC to become the preeminent cryptocurrency. Why did this not happen? Was this due to the technical changes that were implemented in BCH or social political reasons? Uh, E.g. BTC had a larger, more engaged community. It was social and political reasons. And uh, the prim primarily the reasons were that uh, there was a disagreement first about how to expand capacity, whether that should be done with a second layer network like Lightning um, and fixing malleability or whether it should be done by simply increasing the block size. The argument uh, then became, well, who would be able to run nodes if you had a larger block size and you needed more bandwidth? And then the argument became, who should make that decision? Um, and then it became a power struggle. And in that power struggle, there were a lot of hurt feelings and ultimately um, BCH decided to increase the block size. We later found out that, in fact, uh, miners had very good reasons to, to resist SegWit for their own profitability because they were using a shortcut uh, in the SHA-256 mining code that SegWit broke. Um, and that was their secret industrial power. And it is a whole set of scandals and rumors and uh, behind the scenes and a lot of hurt feelings and egos. The bottom line was that uh, ultimately um, BCH did not manage to um, uh, persuade people that it was the better Bitcoin. And um, people decided to stay with BTC. I think a lot of it had to do with the fact that the developers uh, who were part of Bitcoin Core, who had been building Bitcoin for so long, the vast majority of developers remained with BTC. And so backing BCH meant backing uh, a system that was developed by a minority of developers who had disagreed. And uh, there were certainly some risks with that. Um, why one succeeded versus the other didn't? Um, there's the maximalist answer, which I could give you, which is because there was only ever one true Bitcoin and all of the others are fake shit coins and should have died immediately. But that's not really um, 
what I believe. Um, ultimately, I think it was because um, Bitcoin will always preserve the status quo and make it difficult to make big uh, changes um, because it has a conservative um, philosophy behind it. And conservative with a small c, conservative meaning uh, one that wants to preserve things as they are rather than introduce change that might um, endanger its future. So things move slowly, very deliberately, very carefully in Bitcoin. And if you try to move things fast and then you say, well, you're not moving fast enough, so I'm going to go and make a change uh, without you, um, the community has now shown that you will lose that battle. Okay, let's go to the four questions that are in the Q&A um, and see. First question from Andre Juliao. Uh, what's the incentive to run a Bitcoin node? No earnings, hardware depreciation. I don't understand the economic value to run a full node. It's really simple. You run a full node because you want to be able to validate transactions and remain uh, in sync with the Bitcoin blockchain. And the reason you do that usually is because you have an economic incentive to know if a transaction has been confirmed. And you want that answer to be given to you by the software that you control so that you cannot be lied to. I sell stuff in a shop. When I sell something, for example, when I let's take something silly, right? Um, a T-shirt. Uh, when I ship that T-shirt, if I haven't been paid, I'm going to lose that money, right? Once it's shipped, it's out of my control. Um, so if uh, my shop thinks that it has received Bitcoin, but in fact it has not, I will lose. The economic incentive exists for me to run a node behind the operation of that shop so that when um, a customer checks out and they pay with Bitcoin, I can confirm through my own node that is properly configured and does not lie to me that the transaction that paid for that t-shirt, let's say, happened, that it was confirmed. In fact, that three confirmations happened. And once three confirmations have happened, that's my number for t-shirts. I think it's more than enough. Um, I will ship that t-shirt. It's as simple as that. So I have the economic incentive. Now, obviously, for a t-shirt, it's not a very large economic incentive. Um, now think about an exchange. If you have a deposit of half a million dollars and you're about to give someone uh, an equivalent amount of cryptocurrency that they can take and go away um, for another cryptocurrency, um, would you want to make sure that you've received that Bitcoin. Now, as you can imagine, there are the economic incentives are huge. If you can't tell if a transaction has actually been confirmed six times um, and you're about to give someone uh, a very large amount of uh, money effectively in a corresponding transaction, that can cost you a lot of money. So the economic incentives to run a node is so that you can have authoritative validation of whether a transaction has happened or not so that you can confirm them yourself. Uh, Lucia asks a follow-up, what if they pay using the Lightning Network? Can you be sure you receive it if you run a shop? Yes, um, and for that reason, I run my own Lightning node. I don't depend on somebody else's Lightning node to tell me if I've been paid, um, and so my shop has a Bitcoin node and a Light node and a Monero node uh, as well running in the background in order to ensure that when those payments come through, they have actually been paid. So yes, uh, uh, same thing with Lightning. John asks, uh, when I read about the transaction malleability problem, it appears to me basically to be a troll-like attack on the transaction. The attacker changes the ID can trick the remitter to send a second transaction, but unless the receiver is the one changing the ID, there's really no benefit to the attacker, thus making it like a troll-like attack, like a terrible trick. Is that a fair way to simplify the problem? 
yes, um, it is. You can change the ID, but nothing else. So you can't change who gets paid or how much they get paid. However, if you control the sender of the transaction into believing that the transaction never went through because you changed the ID and they're looking at it on an ID basis instead of a UTXO basis, and this was a misconfiguration, um, an exchange that is stupidly looking at transaction IDs to confirm withdrawals instead of UTXOs to confirm withdrawals uh, can be tricked into allowing a second withdrawal or even a third and a fourth withdrawal, um, essentially draining its entire wallet um, to a determined attacker. And that's one of the things that happened to one of the early exchanges called Empty Gox. Uh, we jokingly call it empty gox uh, instead of MT gox uh, because it became empty gox. Um, uh, the problems did start earlier. Transaction malleability is not what caused the ultimate loss of money. At least that's not what we think. But the bottom line is that certainly transaction malleability made it worse because empty gox was mistakenly checking transaction IDs instead of checking UTXO. It was a very poorly coded exchange. No exchange would make that mistake today, um, but they did then. If CoinJoin non-custodial mixers like Wasabi, Samurai, and JoinMarket have not been considered obliged entities under AML regulations, how are they different from Tornado Cash, which the US has sanctioned? Isn't Tornado Cash a mixer also? Um, not sure what it is enough to know if it's non-custodial or not. Yeah, Tornado Cash is also non-custodial. Uh, it uses a smart contract with a zero knowledge proof to implement a non-custodial smart contract based mixer. Um, and uh, Wasabi Samurai and Join Market have not been considered uh, obliged entities uh, in some places, but they have in others. Um, and they have been under pressure to implement whitelists, blacklists, and KYC um, in some circumstances. Uh, it depends how centralized their operation is. For completely decentralized coin join, there's no one to sanction. You can't make, uh, there's no specific address, specific transaction, or entity to list as the obliged entity. And that's the only reason that it hasn't been done. Um, same thing with uh, blockchains that have built-in privacy at the blockchain layer like Zcash and Monero. You either have to make the entire blockchain illegal, which, by the way, would set a very dangerous precedent. Um, you can't sanction specific addresses because you can't see specific addresses. Um, Tornado Cash was easier to sanction because the smart contract could be identified, um, some of the smart contract, and the entity behind it could be identified. Um, but you can also run a smart contract that implements Tornado Cash um, on another address. That's, uh, and, and so people have gotten around that. Uh, really, these are situations where it's an arms race. As each system gets smarter, the regulators get smarter, uh, it's a constantly moving target. There's no fundamental distinction between these systems other than the exact details of how they operate. But because of the way regulations and laws is, is done, um, the technical details matter. And if the technical details are sufficiently different, the regulators find themselves in a bit of a pickle because what they're regulating is changing faster than they can regulate it. Um, Julie asks, is the concept of a nonce the same in Bitcoin versus Ethereum? That's an interesting question. Uh, no. Um, so in Ethereum, there is a transaction nonce. And the transaction nonce is um, set in each transaction, and it's used to sequence transactions from the same wallet. Uh, whereas the nonce that's used in uh, Bitcoin is um, used in the proof of work uh, algorithm. Um, I can't remember the exact definition of the word nonce, so I'm just going to pull it up in a, in a dictionary. 
Uh, excellent. Yes. British slang for pedophile. That's not the one we're looking for. Um, mm, let's see. Very good. The present or particular situation. Um, so a dictionary will not give you a good answer on this um, because it has a slang <laughs> term. That's funny. I didn't know that was used like that. Um, so a nonce is uh, a number that is used only in the present occasion. Number used only once. Um, oh, somebody already uh, wrote that out. Yeah. So in computer science, uh, nonce means uh, something that you use once and it's a throwaway. Um, uh, in the case of Ethereum, uh, a nonce me by being put in a transaction ensures that um, it's only used once, which means you don't have two transactions competing for the same nonce. And that allows you to sequence transaction because the number is not repeated. So that's really the strict definition of number used once. <coughs> Pardon me. But uh, in Bitcoin, that's not really it because um, it's not only used once. You could have uh, the same nonce uh, used in two different blocks. Um, and so that's, uh, I guess you use it once in each block. Uh, thank you for your assistance in the chat with that definition, Arno and Luis, who uh, popped up with number used once. Um, okay. Uh, Carlo asks, is it a risk that in the future, the gigabytes needed to store the Bitcoin software with all the historical transactions will be so big that only a few computers and nodes will be able to store it? That will mean the power of the validators will transition from uh, lots of people to a small, powerful group. <laughs> um, yes. Uh, that is the core of the debate between big blocks versus small blocks, between BH, Bitcoin Cash, uh, BSV, uh, and BTC, and many other blockchains. This is um, one of the core aspects of blockchains that you need to understand. Um, and really, it has to do with the overall uh, um, trilemma, which is security, decentralization, and efficiency. Pick any two. Um, you can't get all three. So the real issue, however, is not storage. Hard drives um, grow almost at Moore's law. And with SSD, because uh, solid state drives, because they're essentially chips, they grow at, uh, at Moore's law. And the, the numbers are perfectly fine. It's growing much, much faster. The capacity of hard drives is growing much, much faster than the Bitcoin blockchain is growing. And we can do various optimizations. Uh, you know, uh, the current Bitcoin blockchain, 350, 400 megabytes. Um, if you add full indexing of all UTXO, maybe a, a terabyte, uh, it's trivial. It's nothing, even for a Raspberry Pi. You can buy a terabyte uh, hard drive or even a two terabyte hard drive for under a hundred bucks. Um, so that's not the problem. The problem is bandwidth. Uh, if you want to be able to bootstrap your node from block zero, you have to download all of this data once. Uh, and in fact, you end up downloading and uploading it to your peers uh, more than once, several times more than once. And then that total amount, a terabyte, transmitted over your DSL, your cable modem, your fiber optic cable, uh, that absolutely becomes a problem. So the real constraint isn't storage, it's bandwidth. Uh, and this issue of bandwidth and who would be able to download the full blockchain on initial bootstrap was at the core of the debate um, in 2017 over block size and continues to be contentious in some circles. But um, in order to preserve decentralization, uh, Bitcoin has limited the size of a block um, which causes more expensive fees, um, but ensures that more people can run it. 
and and that was the trade-off that was decided uh, in BTC. Uh, different trade-offs by other forks of Bitcoin. All right. And actually, we, we managed to get through all of the Q&A. We managed to get through all of the follow-up questions in the chat and all the questions in the forum just in time. Um, thank you so much for attending. I'll see you all next week. Have a wonderful weekend. Uh, thank you for the great questions this week. Please ask your questions in the forum in advance if you can. I will prioritize these. And uh, I look forward to seeing you in a week. Have a good one, everyone. Bye.